of all of God's creatures, there is only one that cannot be made the slave of the lash. That one is the cat. If man could be crossed with the cat, it would improve man, but it would deteriorate the cat. Mark Twain. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I'm your host. I'd like to thank everyone who's kept up and is continu uh, continuing to listen, excuse me, and I hope you enjoyed this episode, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the prior ones as well. So this week is kind of going to be a transition uh, episode. It's going to, um, we've completed the kind of the overview of humanity at 10,000 BC, and the next episodes, um, well... The next main episodes, I guess starting Season 3, uh, we're kind of uh, going to jump forward a couple of thousand years to about 8,000 BC, and it will cover a little bit after that. Um, it'll be a time frame that I'll kind of lay out um, when we get there. I'm still debating on like a set end date. Uh, but, uh, in the meantime, uh, there are some developments that are either happening kind of towards the end of where we stopped, um, I guess, last time, uh, and they will take place during that kind of jump period. Um, and it's essentially going to cover kind of the big factors that are going to affect how we're developing going forward. Um, our technology, for the most part, is going to stay stone-based, obviously, um, but there's not going to be a huge amount of innovations. Um, people are going to develop other things like uh, starting to get to ceramics or things like that. And it already exists. We, we talked about that in our China episodes. And um, But what we're going to talk about for the next couple of kind of intermediate episodes is going to be about domestication of animals and plants. And uh, that's kind of the focus that we'll get on. So... Uh, Instead of just wasting time just talking about uh, what the episode entails, let's get to the actual episode itself and get to the meat of the subject, as it were. We are going to be starting with animals. And the reason I'm doing this is because once we get to the 8000 BC time frame, um, we will be starting to focus on peoples again of the world. And um, I'm not sure I would be able to go into the level of detail I would like when it comes to the evolution and development of our new resources of domesticated animals and, and crops too, uh, which again will have its own episode. Um, I'm sure I'll bring some of the subject matter in this episode up again, but think of this as like a starting point and overview. Um, I'm also doing this because this will actually cover the biggest developments in our lifestyle that we're making during our time jump. Uh, and this includes both animal and crop domestication. So, and to start that off, I'm going to give a customary disclaimer. The dates I'm giving are not exact, and the processes I'm about to describe were not done all at once, and they did not happen in like a perfect sequence. I'm sure there were dead ends and failures along the way. And there was not a single person or even group solely responsible for these achievements. Uh, sometimes local wild versions of similar tame animals would be crossbred or domesticated at later times. Uh, this process took many years and many groups. Uh, and I should also just define domestication because I think the general public view is that we found these plants and animals in the wild as they are, but just basically gain control over them. That is not the case. Domestication is a process where humans modify species of animals and strains of crops physically and behaviorally and turn them into a different species, as it were. As you can tell this definition, um, or as you can tell by this definition, this process takes time. And so without another way, let's begin our discussion of domestication with our animal companions. Um, we started to domesticate the wolf into the dog around 23,000 years ago, give or take, and this was probably done at multiple stages um, 
and at multiple times, or, 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 you know, multiple locations around the similar time frame. Uh, we're talking within, you know, 100 to 1,000 years, similar time frame. And there have been times where later, I'm sure, wild dogs were added back into, um, or I'm sorry, wild wolves were added back into dog gene pools. But anyway, by the time frame that we're discussing now, dogs had been our companions for around 11 millennium. Uh, so it, it took a while before we added the next animals we're, we're to tame, which are goats and sheep. Now, goats and sheep are closely related. Uh, if you think about the taxonomic ranks, they share the same kingdom, phylum, etc., up to tribes on the on the rank scale. So they're close enough relatives that they can be interbred, but it is difficult for conception, and their offspring are sterile. Uh, they're called a shoat or a geep, I think is the kind of the... <laughs> Uh, hybrid name. I don't think there's a firm scientific uh, term for it. Um, but again, those are extremely rare and they're not bred on purpose. I think all of the confirmed cases that we have of them have been done in, like, in a scientific setting. Um, so I, and I imagine there probably have been unrecorded historical examples of them, but I doubt that it ever would have been done on purpose. Uh, by humans, at least. So... Uh, now, both of these animals share like an initial, kind of initial areas of domestication in the Anatolian Peninsula, which of course is occupied today by modern day Turkey, and the Fertile Crescent, which is that area we talked about kind of as a arc between uh, the Mediterranean coast up to uh, the mountains of uh, or the western Iranian mountains, the Zagros. Uh, and let's just talk, start with the sheep as our ancestors did. Um, first, let's start with the mouflon or the Asiatic mouflon. Uh, these are the ancestors of our modern sheep, uh, though they still exist as they had back in the, in the past. And there are a few variants based on region of the mouflon. Um, I think current DNA evidence shows that the Europe European mouflon is actually probably a feral descendant of the first few, like, first semi-tame or, like, you know, uh, uh, first few generations of, you know, bred mouflon or captive uh, mouflon herds. Um, and that, that were moved into Europe once the... Um, once they were brought there by traveling uh, Asiatic groups. As they're migrating into Europe, they brought, you know, their own Asiatic mouflon that they had started to tame, and then they lost some or some, you know, broke away, and they, they became wild and feral in the area. Um, so, and, but the Asiatic variety... Uh, of Mouflon, they occupied the Caucasus, the Anatolia Peninsula, and a lot of Central Asia. If you see a picture of a wild one today, you would actually probably think it is a goat or a kind of goat. Um, so they have brownish fur on uh, most of their bodies with kind of black and white striping around the faces, uh, bellies and legs, and sometimes around the back as well. Um, the males have very wide curved horns. If you think of like a modern ram, um, but the horns aren't quite as tightly compacted, and they're further out from the head. Um, and that some females can grow horns, but these are much smaller than males. Uh, male horns, obviously. Um, in terms of uh, size, uh, females are about as tall as males, but they weigh about 30% less. So I think a male is um, 50 kilograms, and a female on average is about 35 kilograms um fully grown so that's 110 pounds to 77 pounds basically uh they lived in herds for protection from predators and from the weather you know they huddled together for warmth during cold and rainy seasons um and they reach maturity in about sometime between two to four years it, it can vary depending on availability of food environmental you know inputs all that kind of stuff so it's not an exact science. Um, 
And sometime in late fall or early winter, the herds begin to enter a mating period. Males compete for mating rights against each other and kind of establish a hierarchy based on strength and seniority. Uh, younger males could compete, though they usually don't have a, you know, a real chance to get into the pecking order because they lack size. Uh, so this means that although they're able, young males usually don't mate for another three to four years once they reach maturity. Uh, so males typically defend the exterior of the herd, and they, you know, they would die during, uh, you know, defense instances or dominance displays. Uh, they were much more likely to die before being able to mate. Um, females also establish a hierarchy amongst themselves, um, but even the lowest ranked females will always mate. Um, but that, you know, they would get towards the lower ranked males. Now, it's possible that sheep domestication had already been underway during the last section of the podcast. Um, there is some evidence that you know shows it could have started as early around 11,000 BC. It's minimal, but it is there. And uh, it could mean other things. It could just mean that they became a more favored prey target. But regardless um, of the exact starting point, the most common theory... Um, would be no later than I think 10,000 is the start 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 date. Um, but um, so the most common theory of how the this process started is that humans would catch wild adolescents during hunts, um, or that had wandered away from their herds. Um, you know, if your mothers were attacked or died or whatever. And then they would take these adolescents home. They would then, you know, keep them fed so they could be fattened up for slaughter at a later time. And eventually, as time went on, they may have called a couple of different animals with some combination of sexes or been able to trap a portion of a herd. Um, you know, maybe five or six, they could have ran them into a ravine, you know, kind of blocked off their escape and just kind of trapped them in. Uh... So this could have eventually led to them caring for newborns and raising them from that stage. You know, if you have males and females of animals, um, there comes a point where they're just going to do what comes natural. Um, it's also possible that humans had been hunting the same herds for generations. So this meant that they were probably culling weaker members or overly aggressive males of the herds and even driving off predators from the herds. You know, you, you wouldn't want wolves staking out you know, wolves or even cave lions or mountain lions, things like that. So you'd want to protect them because they're much easier to hunt than those, uh, than those wilder animals. Um, but eventually, uh, this would have created a gradual kind of symbiotic relationship. Um, than just us just following along in their wake and hunting them when, you know, whenever we needed to. So, this kind of leads not to an idea of ownership of land, but of the herds. The herd is ours, basically. Um, it's also possible that there was some combination of these various scenarios that led to tame mouflon and from there eventually to sheep. Uh, now, goats are descended from a different animal. Uh, this wild ancestor, um, or rather, the same wild ancestor, but at actually a couple of different times and locations. Um, these wild ancestors would be found in foothills and mountains in the south and east of the Anatolian Peninsula and the Zagros Mountains. Uh, they would have some overlap with Mouflon territory, uh, but they are much more adapted to steep terrain, which they could use to escape from predators and feed on vegetation growing from like hard-to-reach parts of like mountainsides. Um, these, these goats are descended of a type of um, ibex. Uh, it's called the Bezor ibex. And they would actually be domesticated. I think right now it looks like up to f around four sites or so. Um, or four general locations, I should say, at different times. Um, the first domestications would take place in the south of Anatolia at around 9000 BC. And possibly again in western Anatolia around 7,000. Uh, then what is in modern-day Iran at around 4,600, and then again in eastern Anatolia 
uh, sometime around the 500s BC. Uh, so most modern herds actually come from the later two events. Um, I think what this shows is that goats were more suited to an environment that was less favored and thus kind of less prized in southern and western Anatolia. But in the end, the Zagros and other neighboring mountain ranges, goats would be much more suited and probably worked out a lot better than sheep. Now, for Ibex. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, for Ibex, uh, males have massive horns and are extremely aggressive and territorial. I think more so than the mouflon. Um, females also have horns, though theirs are, again, much smaller. Um, Ibex, from what I can tell, have smaller herds, but Individuals are larger in terms of weight and height than a mouflon. Um, females tend to have a lot more variation in their coat color as well. They can go from kind of like a golden brown and to like reddish almost times fur. Um, but both sexes goats, I'm sorry, both sexes coats will turn gray in the winter. Um, and they have a similar social structure to mouflon, though I think there are less males generally in ibex territory that are or ibex herds they're allowed to mate um i think younger adolescent males that aren't in the hierarchy kind of get cast out so you might see them you might see an occasional lone male ibex either looking for a herd it can get in on or maybe a random lone female uh, otherwise you know they'll kind of live on their own and just look out for themselves um and you should watch videos of these things, um, like climbing mountaintops. They they are able to get almost vertical. Uh, they can climb extremely, extremely steep surfaces. And that's one of the reasons they're good at escaping predators in that region. Um, they're just hard to get to. Um, but, and again, we would probably obtain wild ibex in much the same way as wild sheep. But now, once we have the herds taken over, um, what are we doing to alter these animals physically and behaviorally? Uh, so first, uh, their mobility needed to be controlled and limited. Um, enclosure isn't really possible, I think, at the start. Um, you might be able to like keep them bottled up in a, again, a ravine, a ravine or a cave for a short amount of time. But you know, you would have to get them out quickly to pasture. Um, so again, mobility needs to be controlled and limited. Um, so they would probably tie up or bind the back legs of the animal to slow them down and prevent them from running, um, or just walking too far away. Um, they would also things, you know, use things like a whip or a prod or, you know, hook staves. You know, you think of a crook from a staff, um, of a shepherd, like in, you know, like probably the uh, picture Bible for children, something along those lines. And they would be used to corral and drive, you know, the sheep or goats in whatever direction you wanted them to go. Uh, secondly, the lead male uh, is slaughtered. Uh, this would help limit mobility because without a clear leader, the other males would be more interested in asserting their dominance to take over the open leadership position. And while the males were busy, females and juveniles would be kind of led away or separated. So eventually humans would, you know, once the females were kind of isolated, um, the humans would then, um, <clears throat> uh, they would kind of select their own favorite candidate for lead male. Um, I think at first they would pick the most docile and the easily controlled one. Uh, not because they had a master plan that they knew would allow them to create a tame herd, uh, but probably just out of convenience. I mean, that's probably that's probably the easiest thing to do. If you can control the male, you can control the herd, essentially. Um, and these might not have started as conscious decisions, but they may have been, you know, shortly after that. I think after a generation or two, you might realize, like, hey keeping control of this guy is a lot easier. So um, if it wasn't conscious at the start, it would be very quickly. 
Uh, so uh, the first traits you know that we would desire after pliability would be size, strength, and virility. You know, of course, the ability to mate with as many females as possible. Uh, the other males would be killed or castrated to keep them more docile. Um, in the early days, killing seems the only real option. Um, but you know, if you had a lot of food on hand, you know, you you may have delayed killing those uh, males to a time when food or skins were really needed. Like if you were starting to go, you know, lose a lot of your store or stockpiles, or if you just wanted to make sure you had enough for winter, that might be a good time to get rid of excess males. So this is um, uh, limiting the mobility of the herd and controlling reproduction for the male population. The next step is controlling uh, reproduction of the female population. Uh, healthy females go into estrus or heat at a regular cycle, and if they're carrying a baby, they will not, you know, or caring for a baby, they're not going to be receptive to mating. But if they don't have one, they will be. So what we would do is uh, we would remove the young animals from females as soon as they could be weaned. Um, young males would usually be eliminated early. You know, if you think for you know things like mutton or um, a, a cattle example veal um, you know young males would serve that purpose very tender cuts um, but females would be kept until they underwent sexual maturity and they would be added to the rest of the adult female population of course weak and sickly animals of either gender would be eliminated as soon as possible this is kind of a standard we begin to apply to all of our herd animals we control. Uh, and of course there are some differences based on species or breeds, but by and large this is kind of the process you need to undergo. Um, and this process was replacing basically natural selection with human selection. The selections we're making cause the animals we control to evolve. Um, that's why instead of mufflon, we have sheep, and instead of ibex, we have goats. Because we streamline their breeding process, and we essentially help them speed through generations much quicker, all the while making sure that each subsequent generation's traits appeal to us first and foremost. Or at least we tried to make that happen. I'm sure there were obviously cases where that didn't work out. So at the start, we are selecting and keeping them solely for meat, and any by byproducts after they're slaughtered, uh, with one exception. Uh, their dung could be used for fuel, for fires, and it would be. Um, so uh, that is a rather unfortunate thing you would have to do, I'm sure, burn uh, animal shit for warmth. Um, but, again, it's that or freeze to death, I'm sure you'll burn the shit, <laughs> as it were. Uh, now, um, uh the other byproducts I mentioned are, of course, horns, hides, bones, all, you know, useful in their own way. Um, and I'm sure there are other things that they, they could do with, you know, a dead animal as well. Now, as time goes on, though, we begin to utilize animals for other re reasons. Um, there's a new term that I learned in doing research for this. Um, and the next few parts of the podcast are going to have several byproducts of this. It's called the Secondary Products Revolution. Uh, this is the basic idea that we begin to expand on our use of animals and some plants as just meals. We, we begin to use them as renewable resources uh, before ultimately eating them. <laughs> so uh, this revolution is starting either just before or concurrently with the agricultural revolution, depending on how you define that. Uh, now, this would be when we start to use uh, wool or fur for clothes and dairy byproducts. Uh, so we're not killing these animals for their skins, we're shaving their fur and things like that off and using that to create uh, clothing. Uh, and again, the timing for the on these two items are, or these two processes is up for debate. Um, wool and fleece from sheep and goat would have been, you know, actually they wouldn't have sheared them. They would have actually just been picked 
uh, picking off clumps uh, by hand uh, about so about a once a year uh, when they molted. Um, eventually, uh, once uh, the goods became more and more favored and desired, we would have started to breed those animals to have coats closer to what they are today. Now, of course, different regions give rise to different variants, with some being more suited to this than uh, dairy animals. Uh, now, how long we have been using dairy products is another interesting matter of debate. Uh, but right now, I think the oldest evidence that I was able to find, like a decently sourced reference for, um, was around 5100, or I'm sorry, 5100 BCE uh, in Croatia, our modern day Croatia. They found residue in kind of these old containers it was consistent with kind of like a soft cheese or possibly like a very curdled yogurt. Uh, and of course, we were probably giving milk to children much, much longer than that. So uh, another reason to keep animal herds around is that they would be able to uh, eat plants that humans might not be able to stomach or that just tasted bad. Uh, so that gives us a better or at least a more pleasurable means of gaining the calories from those plants. You give them to the animal, and then you eat the calories from the animal, essentially. Um, now, uh, of course, later, sheep and goats would also be useful for clearing away brush and uh, bushes on land that could be useful for cultivation and clearing away overgrowth that, you know, could even cause wildfires in certain places. Uh, their dung, of course, would also be used as fertilizer as well as fuel later on. Now this is, um, but this is about really the only chores we could employ goats and sheep for. Um, for more intensive work, we would turn to our next group of uh, domesticated animals, that being the cattle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, cattle dom domestication doesn't start until around 8,000 BC. Um, so, and if you think about it, this makes sense. Uh, basically, while mouflon and ibex are bigger than you know you might expect, uh, if you think of just like cute little cows or goats, or I'm sorry, sheep or goats on a farm, um, you know these animals could be dangerous uh, with their horns if you weren't careful or observant. Um, they could, they could mess you up. And wild cows carry all those same dangers. And that's the, it's also magnified due to their massive sizes and higher speeds. So just keep that in mind. Um, they were also much more aggressive, I think, in general. Um, so I imagine any attempt to capture and control them was only done by people who had experience in animal, animal handling um, or who were just extremely desperate. And this couldn't have been easy. Um, the humans who started this process relied on um, the primary ancestors of modern cattle. That species is known as um, the Oryx or uh, Bos primogenius. Uh, this then had an additional three subspecies. Uh, the Eurasian primogenius, uh, the Indian nomadicus, and the African or North African Mauritanicus. Um, and these are represented in a lot of Paleolithic and Mesolithic art. And they have been prime targets for human hunting and were one of the few remaining megafauna in all of those places uh, once the mammoths had died off. So uh, the first two uh, versions of the Oryx play uh, the largest part in our histories. Um, the Eurasian variety is probably the first that domestication began with. Uh, this happened again in the Fertile Crescent and probably involved a very small number of animals actually. Um, I read an article by uh, Bolangino et al. in the Oxford Academic that DNA testing shows that the founding population in this region w could have been as low as 80 heads of cattle. Uh, and to kind of put that into perspective, um, when the American bison was endangered, 
uh, or was considered to be endangered of extinction, its population dropped to about 750. So these Eurasian aurochs would have eventually been bred into uh, taurine cattle or boss taurus. And this is the primary cattle that you see in Europe and Northern Asia. Um, the domestication of the Indian aurochs began a couple of hundred to about a thousand years later, but no later than 7,000 BC. Um, this population, uh, excuse me, this population led to uh, the humped zebu, or Bos indicus, and these cows and their descendants occupy India, southern Asia, and sub-Saharan Africa uh, because they are much better suited to drier, hotter climates. I think their uh, their fur is a little bit shorter, and um, they have uh, kind of similar to uh, camels. They kind of have those pumps at their back to help store uh, you know, fat and things like that to survive a little bit better. Now, I should point out that there are a huge number of cattle breeds and different herds have been bred between each other. And they've been mixed with... Um, bovine cousins, things like yaks, bison, and even remaining aurochs, uh, you know, as they were introduced to new areas. Um, and I wasn't able to get a clear answer on this, but it does appear that the North African aurochs had rapidly died out as the savannah turned to a desert, but I think that some of them did survive long enough to breed with the incoming taurine cattle cousin like what they, you know, whether they were touring at that point or if they were just, you know, in that process of shifting from Eurasian aurochs to touring cattle, I think that they were able to incorporate some um, African aurochs into their DNA strand. Um, and of course, um, Zebu would be interest, uh, introduced to Africa later via sea traders and. Um, they would eventually become much more numerous and popular in the sub-Saharan areas. And I'm sure that you know, they interbred with some of those taurine cows that were there. And that creates a kind of, you know, it, it basically you're recombining all the three, uh, uh, I guess, subspecies of the ancient aurochs into different species of the uh, cattle that we've kind of domesticated. So... And uh, cows could be used for most of the same purposes uh, of sheep and goats, um, with the exception of wool, though there are some long hair cows that could, you know, fill a similar, similar role, I'm sure. Um, but they also provide more than those animals. Um, but that trade-off is that they require much more land and water to keep healthy and productive. So in hilly and mountainous areas or in places without enough grassland, uh, goats and sheep are better suited and would remain the primary herd animals. Um, and if you think about it, uh, you know, if you're in a very mountainous region, you know, say along the Mediterranean, um, you know, you may not need sheep as badly as you do goats because you're in a warmer climate. You don't need that wool, but if you're in, say, someplace like Scotland or somewhere like that, uh, sheep would be useful because they have um, a little bit better wool production. Uh, but, you know, again, there's always exceptions to, you know, that kind of thing. So there's always a, there's always a little bit of mix in places. Um, but because of their size, they were eventually put to work as draft animals pulling carts or sledges. Uh, before eventually being used to plow land when agricultural comes around. Uh, and this work was usually done by a castrated male that was raised specifically for that purpose due to size and strength needed to both wear the equipment for plowing and also you would need the strides and strength to use the equipment as well. So... Uh, these animals are what are usually referred to as an ox. That is that is what that is. Uh, an ox is basically a castrated male cow, or a, I guess a former bull, uh, that has just been, you know, basically fed and beefed up enough just to uh, basically be a work animal. 
Now, like goats and sheep herd, herds, cattle herds become hereditary, and it would eventually become the basis for some economies, um, basically wealth measured in cows own, and you would pay debts with cattle or celebrate with cattle, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, the taming and manipulating of these herds will eventually culminate in a new lifestyle. Uh, the people controlling these animals were no longer nomadic or semi-sedentary hunter-gatherers, but now they are nomadic or semi-sedentary pastoralists. Uh, now, to be sure, they would still hunt and gather, but their herds are the primary source of life, and they would form a major focus of these cultures. Um, this lifestyle change would be subtle at first, and I doubt that it would even be a hard sale to neighbors or extended family members. Um, I'm sure that there were probably contact, uh, conflicts between hunter-gatherer groups that didn't recognize ownership over herds. And in you know early days, I'm sure that there were probably little difference in appearance between tamed animals and their wild cousins. So I imagine that this would increase... Um, both pastoralists' vigilance and aggression towards other groups. And of course, the need for pasture and glasslands probably led to some conflicts as well. Um, though I am sure that there were instances of kind of like peaceful exchange between groups. You know, you give us some of your products, we'll give you some of ours, and we'll just keep, keep away from each other <laughs> as best we can. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you know, when extended family groups, you know, met seasonally as they had done when they were, you know, hunter-gatherers, they would now meet to exchange children as marriage partners. I, and I'm sure there was an exchange of animals, uh, or at least a mixing of the animal bloodlines for, you know, added health and, you know, as a kind of symbolic gesture of peace as well. So, uh, this concept or similar concepts will be seen in later rituals and agreements as we progress in our cultural developments. So, now, there are also those that claim that our domestication of wild animals was key to us establishing a, a patriarchal cultures and religions. So, a lot of aspects or symbols of the male animals we're controlling become signs of uh, masculine power and virility. Ram and bullhorns, just as two examples. Uh, and we will see in the future that there are kings and rulers that associate themselves with these animals uh, for several purposes. Um, uh, then there are those that use the idea of being a member of a herd is the same as being um, weak or subservient. So uh, there are the, also those that claim that us taking over and controlling female animals' reproduction was a, reper uh, was a kind of a precursor to men assuming control over uh, human women's reproduction. Um, now, personally, the people that make these types of claims often conveniently forget or don't know uh, that male breeding and population uh, was even more tightly controlled and that the female hierarchy of the herds was never interfered with uh, unless, you know, uh, females got sick or, you know, they died. Uh, so females keep their places in a herd social structure and that is only interfered with by disease and death. So I think both of these theories are overstated exaggerations at best, and they ignore other aspects of human development that can more easily explain things, you know, things that might be considered patriarchal in our world. Uh, for examples um, against these ideas when it comes to at least the veneration of or connecting ourselves to animals, uh, we've already seen far earlier cases where that happens. Um, we have, uh, I think, 40, around 44,000-year-old cave paintings on Sulawesi showing humans with animal characteristics, hunting pigs. We talked about that. Um, uh, then we also talked about the sand religion where uh, Kagan would originally, um, it, well, all humans, Kagan and all humans, had the power to turn into animals at will and as needed. Um so a lot of the cave paintings in France and Spain have representations of um, of aurochs as well, and uh, so that animal that animal specifically has been revered and favored for much longer than we have had them tamed. 
So, um, now as for the hurting culture leading to patriarchy, I think that if we're pinning that concept to any type of living, it should be to agriculture, or at least I should say city scale agriculture. And uh, we will be discussing that topic and how it led to kind of our own own kind of evolution and domestication in the future. Um, I may talk about that specifically in the next domestication episode, um, or I might need to wait until we get to the rise of the city. I'm not 100% sure, um, but we will get there, um, and I'll, I'll talk about you know how how that changes things for human uh human breeding and the like so uh look forward to that um before though we do still have one animal to cover for this episode and that is the common house cat now for the longest time uh it was believed that the house cats had been domesticated in egypt um, I think the oldest depiction of those animals are found in like Egyptian tombs and temples uh, dating back to, I think the oldest ones are like 18 or 1900 BC. Um, however, I think in 2004, they found some evidence on the island of Cyprus um, at a settlement dated to around 7,500 BC. Um, they found the remains of felines that were very similar to a modern house cat and it was apparently deliberately buried in its own grave like it had its own dug out you know depository for its corpse so it you know it was laid there gently or at least on purpose um and dna revealed that it was related to felis sylvestris libica or the african wildcat and these animals are native to North Africa and the Middle East. I, I know it's called the North African uh, wildcat, or the I'm sorry, the African wildcat, but it's actually it actually has a range outside of Africa as well. So um, this too, uh, there are regional descendants of these, much like the aurochs. Um, there are European, South African, Chinese, and Central Asian wildcats as well. They're all extremely similar to each other and domestic cats in terms of how their skeletons look, hence why the DNA test was done. Um, but from that and other samples from other sources, as well as teeth and bones, they determined that this was a domesticated cat and that it had arrived with humans on the island as they began to permanently settle there around 8,000 BC, so about 500 years after, um, or 500 years before uh, this animal was buried. Now, uh, this group of humans was practicing early types of agriculture and herding. Uh, we will talk more about them in a future episode, but this did give support to a theory about cat domestication. The thought was that cats domesticated themselves. Uh, now, at the time, you couldn't control a, a cat's breeding the same way you could a sheep, goat, or cow. Um, but they began to congregate around humans that had taken to sedentary agricultural lifestyles. Uh, because these humans were storing large amounts of plants and grains and grasses, uh, they, would, uh, they would hunt rodents and pests that ate the types of food we were storing. Now, humans recognized that this was a very helpful service and probably, you know, welcomed them in, you know, into areas that we were storing food, or at the very least, they didn't try to kick them out or drive them away or, you know, hunt them to eat them. Um, unless they were desperate for food, in which case, yes, they would have eaten the cats. But um, now, while all cat breeds are descended from the African wildcat somewhere down the line, uh, different groups domesticated different wildcat ancestors. Uh, Chinese and European wildcat, uh, wildcats were uh, domesticated in separate areas later. Uh, so well after kind of the uh, African wildcat had been tamed or semi-tamed. Um, and cats 
did not spread as widely as dogs did until uh, I'm sorry until um, more societies began to take up agriculture. Um, they don't have the kind of universal um, usefulness as a dog. Not to say that cats are worse than dogs, but uh, you know, as a working animal, cats do slightly less than dogs. We'll say to be generous. Uh, so, yes, as agricultural spread agricultural spreads, uh, cats become uh, begin showing up uh, and become more popular, if you could term it that way. So, um, now since I keep coming up to the subject of agriculture, I should probably stop and focus on our domestication of plants. But um, this episode has gone on for quite a bit uh it's right now at a little over 45 minutes so um uh i think this is probably a very good stopping point so um i hope you enjoyed this episode and i will definitely do another episode similar to this one for other animals that we start to domesticate at later dates uh, or who might even be trying we might be trying to domesticate them right now but we just don't have um a lot of evidence, like hard evidence to support things like, um, uh, like bees, for example, honeybees. So, um, also if you're interested in me talking about terminology and related to specific aspects of any of these animals, um, I'm thinking about doing an episode, um, where we discuss, you know, terminology that these, um, kind of gave rise to, to describe specific aspects of keeping herds or, you know, dairy farming, things like that. Uh, so if you if you would like something like that, please do let me know. Um, you can reach me, of course, at our uh, podcast email at war at revpod at gmail.com or uh, the same handle on Twitter, which I will include or try to remember include in the link for um, or in the episode description. Excuse me. So uh, now for some more housekeeping. Uh, I am going to try and record the episode for plant domestication uh, this upcoming week. I'm hoping I could do it maybe tomorrow night or possibly Wednesday night. Um, I am leaving town. I am going to go out on a trip to California. Uh, I will be there for a week. Uh, I will not be taking a laptop or any kind of work items this is a uh, vacation time so um i will try and have something recorded uh to and like have it ready to upload automatically uh next monday i can't promise that but i think worst case if i can't get that um if i can't get the plant domestication episode written and kind of um uh, recorded. What I will do is I will record an episode that weekend when I get back, that Sunday or Saturday, probably the first or the second, and that will be like our kind of um, our start of our Halloween episodes. Um, and then I will try to release, um, maybe record a couple of episodes, like the Halloween episode and then the plant episode. So. Uh, we shall see, though. Again, I can't promise one next week, but I will try and definitely have out another one the following week. So, But yes, thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed, and I hope you've had a good rest of your day. Thank you. Have a good night. Goodbye.